university. So I would like to start by talking about randomness. Usually, and this is a law in nature, in a closed system, randomness tends to increase. In other words, disorder tends to increase. And this is usually the law of entropy. So in a closed system, disorder tends to increase, especially if we initiated from a non-ideal foundation. And this is exactly true if we take the example of dental implants. Dental implant placed in the bone and surrounded by soft tissue is a closed system. Usually, disorders tends to increase. So peri-implant mucositis, mechanical um, disorders, complications, um, peri-implantitis tends to increase with time. And especially if initiated from a non-ideal foundation, and this is also true. So this is why I feel like it's very important to do a uh, proper planning before placing an implant using digital tools uh, or, con or conventional methods and doing very sophisticated surgeries. But this is only day zero and the success does not depend only on day zero. What about two days after placing an implant? What about six months? two years. This is this also counts for the patient. So I've noticed that almost all or let's say many of the lectures are focusing on day zero and how they've placed perfect implants, uh, perfect all on six. But there is no many lectures about the maintenance, the long term stability. And for me, I think this is as important as placing ideal implants or maybe even more important. So today's topic is more about maintenance, especially in periimplantitis. I was saying periimplantitis. Let's let's define periimplantitis. It is a biofilm associated pathological condition. So already from the definition, we can think about the treatment. It has to be with the reduction of biofilm, and unfortunately, periimplantitis leads to the loss of loss of supporting bone. So it is a crucial. Uh, it is a serious condition that we need to treat. The European Federation of Periodontology, since we don't have, uh, we have only 15 minutes, I will say it quickly, has classified peri-implant health and peri-implantitis is defined as bleeding or probing or superation on probing plus bone loss that is above the normal remodeling of the bone, okay? 20% of patients, this is based on epidemiological studies, 20% of patients that will do dental impl implants will have a risk of periimplantitis. So as a pathology, this is somehow frequent. And 10% of the implants placed will result in periimplantitis. So it is a frequent condition. It results in bone destruction. And it has some risk indicators. Now, there is a studies that are still going on and there is maybe a different um, studies can be somehow controversial, but I'm going to give you the strong evidence today that were proven to be related to periimplantitis, such as, and this is, I, I really want to emphasize on this, such as poor plaque control and lack of regular maintenance therapy. So, Periimplantitis is directly linked to poor plaque control and lack of regular maintenance. And this is why it is very, very important to focus on the long-term stability, the maintenance of our placed implants. There is other area of future research, such as keratinized tissue and etc. Now, these facts are interesting. Periimplantitis is frequent, related to poor uh, oral hygiene related to uh, induced usually by biofilm. But I have summarized here some more interesting facts, maybe uh, fascinating facts about periimplantitis. First of all, its progression is more aggressive than periodontitis. So periimplantitis, the, placing a dental implant maybe is the last treatment that the, the patient will have and already the progression of the bone destruction or its progression is more severe than periimplantitis. It is related to the biofilm and unfortunately it is non-reversible. Its progression is linear, linear and in an accel accelerating pattern. So each year the patient will lose more bone than the previous year, okay? 
after everything that I have just said about its frequency, its severity, I have a very sincere question to ask today. How many of us here perform regular supportive peri-implant care after placing their implants? So maybe the answer will be at least not all of us, maybe 50% of us. So maybe the first conclusion that I can give already in this lecture, in this 15 minutes lecture, is that supportive peri-implant uh, care, regular supportive peri-implant care is very important. The success is not only at day zero, not only in doing the perfect surgery, okay? The European Federation of Periodontology is trying Try, trying to tackle uh, periimplantitis. They've published uh, these approaches and they've concluded, such as the American Academy of Periodontology, that additional approaches are still needed. And this is exactly why we are trying to publish additional approaches. So in this uh, presentation, I will share with you a protocol, one protocol, very briefly. But I just want to say, and maybe this is the second conclusion or the keynote of my presentation, the use of the laser is only an additional tool to the gold standard treatment. So you have to do everything in a conventional way, scaling root planning, mechanical debridement, and using the laser is only an additional tool. There's many ways in using lasers, photobiomodulation, photodynamic therapy, etc. Today, we're going to focus on one special protocol. Why lasers? Because lasers presents deep penetration, so it will uh, enhance the limitations that we have in the mechanical debridement. With the mechanical debridement, you can only clean what you can touch, okay? It has a photodesorption effect. I will explain it very briefly, and maybe this is the most important in managing periimplantitis. The near-infrared light of the laser can directly uh, kill uh, pigmented pathogens, and these pathogens, some of the pathogens that are linked to periimplantitis and periodontitis, are in fact uh, pigmented, such as Porphyromana gengivalis, Aggregate, Bacter, Actinomycetam, Comitont. Finally, lasers present thin flexible fibers. We can go into the depth, into the details, and we can enhance the mechanical debridement. And it can be safe on the titanium because of the short or the super pulsed modes that the lasers can offer. These two studies. Uh, from these two studies, we uh, we did the protocol. These studies are in PubMed, free of access. You can check them. And we don't have time today to uh, tell you why we have chosen these parameters. But according to certain calculations, we we have proven that we've proved that these parameters are safe in terms of increase in temperature and does not result in any severe or any morphological damage on the titanium implants, okay? So as safety, this protocol is safe. As effectiveness, we have uh, proven also that this protocol presents a photodesorptive effect. So photodesorptive effect is, as illustrated here, defined as when the energy is enough to break or separate something that is fixed on metal surfaces. In this case, this something is the biofilm, and the metal is the titanium. So we have proven that this protocol can result in a separation of the biofilm from the titanium surface. And finally, we did a bacteriological study and we have found that there was a, there was a significant decrease after our protocol in the total bacterial count when we compared the contaminated titanium discs plus treatment with laser, when we compared this to sterile implant, there was no significant difference in the total bacterial count. So this protocol is effective, perfect, everything is fine. Now to conclude, there is of course some limitations. First of all, the in vitro study is not as the clinical conditions. So in the in vitro study, everything is ideal. We, can, we are touching immediately the titanium surfaces. In the clinic, the factors are different. So we have to check these factors clinically. Uh, we have to check the effectiveness that we are talking about clinically. Also, we haven't done any PCR tests. So if we haven't done any PCR tests, maybe, for example, this protocol is not as effective as we thought on porphyromanus gengivalis that is directly related to periimplantitis. 
or on the aggregate bacteria actinomycetam committon that is not directly related, uh, uh, that is directly, sorry, related to periimplantitis. So we have to be more specific, more than a total bacterial count of everything that is present in the pocket of the implant. So with everything that I have said, I will conclude uh, maybe everything that I have said in this clinical case. This patient was referred to me um, recently by my father. My father is an endodontist. And in 2017, he referred this patient to a surgeon in order for him to place an implant. So the surgeon did the surgery. When the patient came to me now recently, he is a heavy smoker. He has a very bad oral hygiene. Other than that, there was no systematic condition that can be related. Um, he didn't have, imagine from 2017 until today, there was no supportive peri-implant care. And his chief complaint today was chronic pressure and discomfort in the area of the dental implant. So my diagnosis was peri-implantitis. I've tried to extract some x-rays from the surgeon that he, that uh, did the surgery. So as you can see in 2017, everything was perfect. He placed the implant. In 2022, already there was a peri-implantitis and there was a significant bone destruction. In 2022, the surgeon didn't do anything. He didn't offer any treatment. He didn't control the controllable risk factors or did any supportive peri-implant care. And I've received the patient as you can see in 2023, with more bone destruction. So the conclusion of my presentation is the treatment of this patient. This The treatment conclude everything that I have just uh, talked about today. First of all, we have to, according to the international guidelines and recommendations, we have to control the risk factors that are controllable. So reduce the frequency of tobacco consumption in this patient then we have to motivate con uh, the control of biofilm, okay? So um, I've asked the patient to use interdental brushes, especially in this area, and to buy a water flosser in order to remove the primary risk factor that is biofilm, okay? Then I've performed the gold standard non-surgical treatment, scaling root planning and mechanical debridement with ultrasonic and manual instrumentation using compatible plastics, of course, that are uh, that can be used on implants. And finally, I did the laser-assisted approach that I have just shared with you today. And this is the results only after almost four months of the treatment. Of course, I'm excited. I'm, I'm waiting to take x-rays at six months, one year of treatment. And the most important, today the patient is under supportive peri-implant care. So I have to see the patient each six months. It is mandatory to check the bleeding on probing, plaque index, if there is any separation on probing, and I have to take x-rays in order to control. Okay? So thank you very much. And maybe I just want to emphasize on one thing. When you have periodontitis, in worst case scenarios, you can tell the patient, okay, we can treat periodontitis, we have to extract, after a few months, we have to place an implant. But really the problem is when you have periimplantitis and you are not able to treat it, what would you tell the patient? Usually placing dental implants is the last treatment that we can offer. So um, T0 is important doing ideal implant planning, positioning, everything is very important, but we have also to focus on the maintenance. So thank you so much.